by Sri Lanka's best internet package for online learning and online working with many amazing offers. Call 1212 for more information. Sri Lanka Telecom. Lenka, tu kuma wedi karaga ne? Lao ju rupyal panhata du kala. Mama, en api te ekak bom. Tonight, a new world of work. President Kotabe says that COVID-19 presents an opportunity to reshape work in the new normal. The world of work is undergoing a massive reorganization in the post-COVID-19 period in developed as well as developing countries alike. Another victory. Sri Lanka commended by WHO for earlier than expected eradication of rubella and measles. Harsh words. Prime Minister accuses former government of enabling terrorism through rampant inaction. Cleaning out the house. Narcotics bureau shaken up as more officers arrested for drug smuggling links. All this and much more coming up on this Wednesday, the 8th of July 2020. नव सनलाइट सकुरा देन दिक्कुकल पावतीन सकुरा माल सुंदिन। From Ada Derana, this is Ada Derana first at nine, live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to First at Nine. I'm Shinala Fernando. Moving on to your top stories for tonight. President Gotabaya Rajapaksa says that Sri Lanka views the change brought on by the coronavirus pandemic as a stepping stone to reshape a world of work to suit the new normal in the post-COVID-19 period. Addressing the virtual global summit themed on COVID-19 and the world of work, building a better future of work on international labor organization, the president made note that the safety of life was of utmost importance than the change caused to the country's overall employment profile. President Gotabe Rajapaksa addressed the International Labour Organization's Global Summit on COVID-19 and the world of work, building a better future of work today. The summit was held to discuss the challenges and responses of the countries and regions battling the pandemic and of those starting the recovery process. COVID-19 posed us with perhaps the greatest human crisis in the modern period. As a result, the world of work is undergoing a massive reorganization in the post covid-19 period in developed as well as developing countries alike sri lanka is a developing economy with a sensitive to external determinants we paid particular attention to safeguard our workforce from the shock wave that was created by this pandemic we have an active labor force of 8.6 million the social security measures that we introduced during the covid outbreak covered all sectors of this workforce the most notable one was the payment of a fixed monthly allowance of rupees 5000 to the most affected self employed categories in our workforce during april and may sri lanka has a considerable workforce that is employed outside the country even during the period where restrictions for air travel were imposed we have repatriated nearly 15000 sri lankans from destinations abroad so far although this made a considerable change to our overall employment profile our aim was to secure the lives of our workforce this fraction of the labor force will now have the choice to join the local labor force without returning to their original countries of employment this in turn will shape the new normal of our world of work skill sector of sri lanka required a rethinking and reengineering in order to accommodate the new normal of the post covid period sri lanka has pledged to eliminate hazardous child labor by 2022 abiding by this commitment our department of labor continue to conduct 
investigations on complaints received regarding child labor even during the lockdown period. I believe that the COVID-19 situation globally has not reached an equilibrium where countries can start having long-term plans. However, it has given ample opportunities for creating a new normal in the short term and considering it in the medium term. Sri Lanka views this as a stepping stone towards reshaping her world of work to suit the new normal in the post-COVID-19 period. I sincerely hope and wish that this opportunity will serve as a means for all countries to realign their worlds of work and emerge safer and stronger after this global calamity. Army Commander Lieutenant General Shavendra Silva revealed today that PCR test results of 210 inmates of the Valikada Riman prison who came into contact with a recently discovered COVID-19 positive inmate have all come back negative. Meanwhile, as a precaution, the temporary visitors ban, which was only limited to the Valikada prison, was extended to prisons island-wide by the Commissioner General of Prisons, Sushara Upuldenia. Dozens of Riman prison inmates at the Balikada Riman prison were placed in quarantine after a single inmate transferred from the Kandakadu Drug Rehabilitation Centre tested positive. Accordingly, 179 prisoners who came into contact with the prison inmate were transferred to the Punani quarantine facility under the supervision of the Sri Lanka Army. Furthermore, nine prison guards the inmate came into contact with were also sent into quarantine at the Rajagiri Ayurvedic Hospital and the Institute of Technology in the Agama. In addition, 310 prison inmates who came into contact with the inmate were also subjected to PCR tests. <laughs> In the meantime, 39 others who came in contact with the inmate were also subjected to PCR tests during the day. Following this incident, Commissioner General of Prisons Tushara Upul Denia stated that a decision has been taken to stop all visitors to prisons in the country until further notice. Furthermore, the collation of all information on prison inmates who have been released from the Vatikara prison since the 27th of June has also commenced. In the meantime, COVID-19 recoveries climbed up to 1,967 after 12 patients were discharged following full recoveries. With that, Sri Lanka's total active cases now stands at 115. Further, four naval personnel recovered today, bringing naval recoveries up to 842. In the meantime, the remains of a Sri Lankan migrant worker from Saudi Arabia was brought to the General Cemetery in Boralda for cremation as per quarantine regulations. However, a tense situation arose when family members of the deceased protested against not being allowed to view his remains before cremation. <laughs> However, the cremation went ahead after police arrived at the premises and defused the situation. Corona virus se petriyam balakwan na sabhan yudha dayat sodan na. 
The World Health Organization has commended Sri Lanka and the Maldives for achieving another medical milestone in the midst of a global pandemic threat. Life-threatening viruses, rubella and measles have been eradicated by the two countries earlier than the 2023 target set by the WHO. The announcement was made after the fifth meeting of the Southeast Asia Regional Verification Commission for Measles and Rubella Elimination held virtually. Maldives and Sri Lanka were today verified for having eliminated rubella, making them the first two countries in the WHO Southeast Asia region to achieve measles and rubella elimination ahead of the 2023 target. Dr. Poonam Ketrapal Singh, Regional Director of WHO Southeast Asia region, congratulating Maldives and Sri Lanka on their achievements, stated, quote, protecting all children against these killer and debilitating diseases is an important step in our endeavor to achieve healthier population and health for all, unquote. The announcement was made after the fifth meeting of the Southeast Asia Regional Verification Commission for measles and rubella elimination, which was held virtually. The commission comprises of 11 independent international experts in the fields of epidemiology, virology and public health. A country is verified as having eliminated measles and rubella when there is no evidence of endemic transmission of the viruses for over three years in the presence of a well-performing surveillance system. Maldives last reported an endemic case of measles in 2009 and of rubella in October 2015, while Sri Lanka reported its last endemic case of measles in May 2016 and of rubella in March 2017. Coming at a time when the entire world is grappling with the COVID-19 pandemic, this success is encouraging and demonstrates the importance of joint efforts, Dr. Ketrapal Singh said, lauding the ministries of health, the health workforce, its partners and most importantly, the communities who together contributed to this public health achievement. The police inspector of the Narcotics Bureau and 12 of his colleagues were remanded until the 21st of this month after they were produced before Colombo Magistrate Lanka Jaratna today. Meanwhile, the magistrate also granted the Criminal Investigation Department permission to interrogate all the suspects under detention orders until the 14th of this month. The Criminal Investigation Department has arrested 21 people, including 18 police officers and three civilians, for links with drug traffickers. A Narcotics Bureau constable who was apprehended in Ragama last evening is also among the arrested. Meanwhile, Inspector Samanwa Santakumara of the Police Narcotics Bureau, who was arrested by the CID in Karevata yesterday, is being interrogated under a 72-hour detention order. The 12 officers of the PNB who were interrogated under detention orders, along with the constable, arrested in Ragama yesterday, were produced before Colombo Chief Magistrate Lanka Jayaratna today. In court, Deputy Solicitor General Dilip Apiri stated that some of the apprehended smuggled drugs via international drug dealers and were engaged in drug rackets by concealing stocks in their houses and vehicles. The Deputy Solicitor General also told court that drugs and weapons have been distributed in international waters using special boat operators. Meanwhile, another investigation was launched following the discovery of an illegal firearm in the possession of a PNB officer, along with counterfeit currency worth 160,000 rupees discovered in the possession of two police constables. Deputy Solicitor General Dilip Apiris also informed court that 390 milligrams of cocaine were seized from the private locker of the PNB IP, adding that 12 grams and 22 milligrams of heroin, 4 grams of marijuana and T56 ammunition were taken into custody after being found in the possession of another officer. It was also revealed in court that the suspects lived luxurious lives from selling seized stocks of heroin to drug traffickers while faking raids to receive awards, commendations and millions of rupees in cash prices from the police fund. The Deputy Solicitor General added that the police officer named as the seventh suspect in the case and another officer had recently purchased two blocks of land near the Kottava Expressway at a cost of 10.7 million rupees, which was earned through drug trafficking. Furthermore, the Deputy Solicitor General revealed the involvement of more officers attached to the PNB in addition to the arrested group of officers. He said that the lack of proper supervision by the DIG or director in charge of the Police Narcotics Bureau has inadvertently encouraged such illegal activities. The Deputy Solicitor General emphasized that unlike Vile Sudha, these suspects were involved in drug dealing using their uniforms and official powers. Also making submissions to court, Investigative Supervisor ASP Meryl Ranjan Lamaheva stated that steps have been taken to seal nearly 700 kilograms of heroin. 
Following a request made by the investigating officers, the chief magistrate ordered the government analyst to submit a report on a possible adulteration of the drugs with other substances. The magistrate also ordered the CID to make submissions to court on the charges against the 12 suspects separately when the case is next taken up for hearing. The Presidential Commission of Inquiry investigating the Easter Sunday attacks heard more evidence from serving and former intelligence officials who highlight serious derelictions of duty by the country's national security heads. The Commission was told of reports made by Sri Lanka's National Intelligence Service on the threat of extremists had been circulated at the ministerial level but fell on deaf ears, resulting in no action. The Presidential Commission of Inquiry investigating the Easter Sunday attacks yesterday heard evidence from a serving military intelligence official who was formerly an international intelligence liaison attached to the office of the National Intelligence Chief. The official told the Commission that following several military setbacks experienced by ISIS in Syria and Iraq since 2016, the group's focus had shifted to deploying its combatants to the Far East in order to carry out attacks. He revealed that the Office of the National Intelligence Chief had accordingly kept a close eye on these developments and also drawn up an eight-point special report to prepare for and counter any such moves towards Sri Lanka. The witness added that in 2016, the report had been shared with the then Chief of National Intelligence, Cicero Mendis, Defence Secretary at the time, Karuna Sena Hitiya Rachi, and the Minister of Law and Order, Sagal Ratnayaka. The Commission was told that through the report, the Minister of Law and Order had been made aware of the threat of attacks being carried out by combatants who had been trained abroad and returned to the country. The witness noted that although a copy of the report had also been shared with the then State Minister of Defence, Ruban Vijayvardhana, and Minister Sagal Ratnayaka, no action had been initiated by the government at the time. Meanwhile, retired Major General Kapila Hendavitarna, who served as the country's first national intelligence chief following the establishment of the position in 2006, testified before the Commission this morning. Major General Hendavitarna told the Commission that one of the primary responsibilities of the state intelligence chief upon receiving prior warnings of any attacks would be to brief and discuss the information with the national intelligence chief. In addition, the witness stated that while the chief responsibility for matters of national security lies with the President, the Defence Secretary too bears accountability for such matters. The Commission then inquired from the witness as to who bears responsibility for National Security Council meetings not being held. The witness replied that both the President and Defence Secretary bear joint responsibility for such a lapse. The Commission was told that following reports of a Sri Lankan national having lost his life after travelling to Syria and joining ISIS as a combatant, a separate unit was set up by the State Intelligence Service to monitor extremist activities. The witness added that with the new government taking office following the presidential election in January 2015, he had tendered his resignation from the post of National Intelligence Chief. The Commission was told that the reason for his resignation stemmed from his prior experience working with members of the incoming government in 2001, where he felt that he would be unable to carry out his duties effectively. In the meantime, former Defence Secretary Hemasiri Fernando and IGP Pujit Jayasundara arrived at the Presidential Commission to record statements at the Police Investigation Unit. The individual who sustained critical injuries in an explosion at a house in Iakachi Pale, Kilinochi, succumbed to his injuries this morning. A minor explosion took place on July 3rd at the home of the victim who was an ex-LTTE carder, causing him serious injuries. He was admitted to the Jaffna Hospital, after which he was transferred to the Anuradhapura Hospital for further treatment. During investigations, police recovered three locally manufactured bombs, a banner containing a Black Tiger's Day message, explosives and a photograph of an ex-LTTE carder at the bomb site. The wife of the deceased suspect, a school teacher, and two other persons were arrested by the Terrorism Investigation Division and are currently being interrogated under detention orders. More news on the other side of this break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. In more news, Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa accused the previous government of enabling the resurgence of terrorism due to its inaction on intelligence warnings. The Prime Minister blamed the former good governance regime for systematically dismantling the country's intelligence services and leaving the door open for the Easter Sunday attacks to happen. Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa participated in a public event in support of Kurnagala district candidates of the Sri Lanka Podujana Peramuna in Giriola last evening. 
රටේ නිදහස් කරගත්තම ඊ ආණ්ඩුව කාලේ තුල නැවත ත්‍රස්තවාදයක් බී වෙන්න ආණ්ඩුව වැඩ කරා විශාල ජීවිත සංඛ්‍යාවක් නැති වුණා ඉතා බොම්බ ප්‍රහාරයේ තොරතුරු ඔක්කොම ලැබිලා තියෙන්නේ ඒ මුස්ලිම් නායකයින්ගේ තොරතුරු ඉදි දීලා තියෙන්නේ ඒවා ගැන කිසිම උනන්දුවක් දැක්වේ නැහැ ඒ ආණ්ඩුව ඒ ආණ්ඩුව ඒකට ඉඩ දුන්නා එහෙම දෙයක් වෙන්න අපි චෝදනා කරනවා අද ඒ ආයට චෝදනා කළ යුතුව තියෙනවා මේ කරපු අපරාධය පිළිබඳව එහෙම රටක් ඉදිරියට ගෙන යන්න බෑ බුද්ධියංශය සම්පූර්ණයෙන් විසිරෙව්වා බුද්ධියංශය නිලධාරීන් පිටරට ඇවුවා යවලා මේ තොරතුරු වසන් කරගෙන තමයි මේ වැඩ පිළිවෙල දියත් කරේ තමුන් වහන්සේලා ගියවර ජනාධිපතිවරයාව පත් කරා ගෝඨාභය මහත්තය දැන් යාට ඒ වැඩ ටික කරන්න දුන්න පොරොන්දු ඉෂ්ට කරන්න පාර්ලිමේන්තුවක් තියෙනවා නම් පාර්ලිමේන්තුව වැරදි පැත්තකට ගියොත් දෙන්න අද පැත්තට අදින්න පුළුවන් කමක් නැහැ ජනාධිපතිවරයා එක පැත්තකට අගමැතිවරයා අනිත් පැත්තට කැමිටි මන් මණ්ඩලයේ තහ පැත්තකට ඇද්දොත් ඒ රට සංවර්ධනය කරන්න පුළුවන් වෙන්නේ නැහැ In the meantime the National Archaeological Conference was held today at the Sri Lanka Foundation Institute under the patronage of the Prime Minister Prime Minister Rajapaksa also planted a tree at the premises to mark the conference Leader of the Samagijana Balavege Sajid Premadas has stated that devolution through a strong provincial council system can help prevent any resurgence from terrorism in the country. He made these comments at a public gathering that worked off in Kirindivela yesterday. Samagijana Balavege leader Sajid Premadas attended a campaign event at Kirindivela yesterday. Singhala bahutta kamata mooltana laba denna tona haba eki ya Sri Lanka va tula ale bedapu palat sabhakramaya රටට ආදරය කරන පුද්ගලයෝ හැටියට පළාත් සභා ක්‍රමය රැක ගන්නට ඕන. ඒක මම එදත් කිව්වා. අදත් කියනවා හෙටක් කියනවා. මේ රටේ නැවතත් වරක් ත්‍රස්තවාදයක් නොවෙන්නට නම් අනිවාර්යයෙන්ම පළාත් සභා ක්‍රමය ශක්තිමත් කරවල ක්‍රියාත්මක කරන්නට ඕන. In the meantime on the public gathering of the Samagijan Balavege worked off in Kalania. මේ අවස්ථාවාදී ආණ්ඩුවක් Taman සුරකින ආණ්ඩුවක් ඒ නිසා තමයි අච්චර බරපතල ප්‍රකාශයක් කර අදටත් කරුණා නිදල්ලේ ඉන්න හැම තැනකම සිද්ධ වෙන්නේ ජනතාව මුලා කිරීම ලොකු විශ්වාසයක් තිබෙනවා එදා නොවැම්බර් 16 වෙනිදා මං මුලා වුණු හැදෙනම ලක්ෂය අද බොහොම උනන්දුවෙන් බලාගෙන ඉන්නවා පාර්ලිමේන්තු මැතිවරණයේදී වෙනසක් ඇති කරන්න ඒ වෙනස ඇති කරන කොට මේ රටේ බිහි වෙන්නේ හදවතක් ඇති ආණ්ඩුවක් The United National Party has lodged a protest with the Election Commission today, accusing the Samagi Janabala Vege of usurping the UNP Green in its campaign activities to intentionally mislead voters. Meanwhile, United National Party leader and former Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe told members of the public today that their choices remain money in their hands or electing a parliament from the same party. United National Party General Secretary Akhila Viraj Karyavasam has written to the election commission seeking its intercession to prevent the Samagi Janbala Vegya from using the UNP's party color green during its election campaign. The letter states that as per the United National Party's constitution, the party color is officially set as green, while the Samagi Janbala Vegya constitution states its party color as the color blue. The letter informs the commission that the Samagi Janbala Vegya is currently using the green color in its campaign activities. Further the UMP general secretary claims this to be an intentional act of the Samagi Janbala Vegya to mislead United National Party voters. The letter calls on the election commission to take immediate steps to prevent the use of the UNP's official party color by the Samagi Janbala Vegya. Veswalaga pujjalayanta tamange deshapalana pakshaye kelin kiyewa nohaki pujjalayanta tamange deshapalana pakshaye varneya pahadiliwa kiyanna bari pujjalayanta tamange watina chandaya nodiyutui Meanwhile the working committee of the United National Party met this morning at the party headquarters Sirikota under the patronage of party leader Ranil Vikramasinghe. UNP Yodayan hate eta hitapu kattiyat gihilla thiyena ne. Den api Ranil Singhe Premadasa mattuma ge gaalet gaamini disa nayaka wenne UNP Yodayan mehema gihilla wenna paksha hadagana kiyena i think. Meka vitame vela thiyena i think e gana echchara prashna ne. I think atte mahamathi wanne kata api paksha kattiyata idiripath wenne. Idiriyedi rate janathawata kohomada api sevaya karanne. E golang mathi wanne eta idiripath wenne goda na gihilla kallanna. In the meantime the UMP leader attended a public meeting in Talapat Pitiya today. Api warmak illa. Api warama illanne obbe atata aapo salli da. Ite wedagath ekak agamathi janadhipathi eka pakshen ekka paulen danawada atara salli denawa. Aanduwata ada videsha winime hoya ganta beha. Hai loke vishwase ganna beri mama kiyena eksat jathika pakshe aanduwa danna agosto palaweni sati 3 weni sati rissela api sakachcha karana kohomada we mudal ganna kiyana. 
In response to a request of the government of Sri Lanka, the government of Japan has agreed to provide 1.36 billion rupee grant under the Japanese non-project grant aid scheme for the provisioning of necessary medical equipment such as MRI scanner, CT scanner, bedside X-ray systems, central monitors, bedside monitors and defibrillators to strengthen the COVID-19 preventing activities in Sri Lanka. The exchange of notes pertaining to the grant was signed by Secretary, Ministry of Finance, Economic and Policy Development, SR Articular, on behalf of the government and His Excellency Sugiyama Akira, Ambassador of Japan today at the Ministry of Finance, Economic and Policy Development. We'll return after this short commercial break. Stay tuned. Welcome back in your business news. People's Bank has agreed to initiate a program to develop micro, small and medium enterprises in the country in collaboration with Industrial Development Board under the Ministry of Industries and Supply Chain Management. Accordingly, the bank and the IDB have decided to empower 5,000 MSMEs with technical and managerial support and the proper financial facilities to ensure sustainability of them. The loan amounts are to be decided on the volume of the requirement and the financial feasibility and viability of the project, while the loan will be considered subject to the conditions stipulated in the relevant SME loan products. Sri Lankan stocks ended 0.24% weaker today as the old share price index fell 0.24% or 12.26 points to end at 5069.52. Meanwhile, the S&P SL20 index of more liquid stocks declined 0.77% or 17.2 points to 2195.68. Market turnover was 1 billion rupees while 70 stocks gained and 76 fell. Here's a brief report on the market performance today. Today we saw the market gain in the red uh, basically uh, down by about uh, 12 points. We are seeing a sort of a stagnant uh, market condition these days. Today the market was in red after yesterday the market being in the green by only by about 5 points. So this uh, stagnant condition is uh, mainly coming due to tomorrow's uh, monetary policy announcement where uh, most investors are on a, a wait and see approach until the monetary policy announcement. Uh, we are also uh, still seeing a significant amount of turnover despite the low uh, stagnant market conditions that is there in the market. So uh, the market turnover again went above 1 billion rupees. So we are seeing for now about uh, one and a half months basically continuously high level of market turnovers retail high net worth activity are significantly high basically local investors are the predominant uh, party that is uh, present in the market with that uh, we are starting to see mixed reactions from the local participants mainly because of the upcoming monetary policy announcement so there is a bit of profit taking in some of the counters as well with the banking sector significantly moving up in value and some of the other mid-cap counters including the construction sector counters that have significantly moved up in value from their lows. So with that if you take the foreign uh, side of things, again uh, seeing a, another foreign outflow today, not a big surprise. So about 205 million of uh, net foreign outflow we are seeing and with that uh, the predominant selling is coming from John Keyes Holdings, Commercial Bank and Tokyo Cement Non-Voting.
In our international news, Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro said yesterday that he had tested positive for the novel coronavirus after months minimizing the severity of the pandemic and defying medical experts, even as the virus has killed more than 66,000 people in his country. The right-wing populist gave the news to reporters at his official residence standing just inches away from him, adding to criticism of his cavalier approach to the outbreak in Brazil, the worst, the worst worst rather outside the United States. The president said he was taking hydroxychloroquine that has been touted by Trump and some of his supporters and pro-government factions in Brazil as a potential cure. With that we wrap up tonight's edition of First at Nine. Thank you for joining. I'm Shinola Fernando. Good